The stars send the correct time. From the Elgin Observatory in Elgin, Illinois, we bring you by direct wire correct star time. Correct to the hundredth of a second. Elgin is the only watch company in the world maintaining an observatory, observing, recording, and broadcasting time from the stars. When you hear the final tone beat, it will be exactly 9.16 Central Standard Time. 9.16 Elgin Observatory Time.
so that as the Earth would spin, they would know the exact moment when a star would cross. And heavens to Betsy, should there be an earthquake or a truck driving by or some kind of settling and the telescope would shimmy one way or the other, it would be off and all the measurements would be off. So they would twist the telescope around the opposite direction. In the evening, and look out towards that light. And when the light would shine into the telescope, there are these light bulbs on the sides and these color wheels, red and blue, there's color wheels, and there's a mirror inside. So there was a way that they would allow the light to move through and look for different color combinations to know if it was truly, totally lined up with the North Pole. They were very into accuracy. Another example of the accuracy is the level tester, which is over here. Right on here, there's a level. This whole contraption comes off. And I can put it right on the telescope. Hangs on. And, well, it's a level. We're checking to make sure that the telescope didn't settle overnight and that it's really, truly level. If it wasn't level, down in here and twist it and lift it up a little bit. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it's neat that it fits right in there, custom made for this telescope. But that device that it was sitting on is a level tester. It's actually called a level tester. So I don't know exactly where the end point would be, but they would use this device to make sure the level was level. But there's measuring tools, they're, they're tiny. But there's little spinning knobs and there's a little magnifying lens so you could read teeny tiny numbers that they would use this contraption to make sure that the level was level before they tested to make sure the telescope was level. They were really, really into accuracy around here. This is the chronograph machine that the telescope operator, when he hit the button, was electrically tied to a pen that was sitting in here. This drum would spin one time every minute, according to the slave clocks that were back here attached downstairs. One time every minute it would spin. This thing would start over here in the morning and would slowly move over the course of 24 hours. So there's enough paper on here to last an entire 24 hours. This is rotating slowly, it's making little marks on here that gets converted into something like this. And there's a lot of math involved. So we have 11 little spots for each star that went past for that night. And they can calculate whether the Earth is a little bit ahead or behind. There's master clocks that we don't have anymore that were on this wall. They were set then according to these mathematical computations, and they would correct they the would clocks. Correct yes. But they don't have They would correct anything. the clocks that you saw downstairs in the clock wall. And there were two different clocks because one is on star time and one is on solar time. The clocks would send a little electrical impulse to the pen so that every second they would do a little jump. And then when somebody at the telescope hit the button, it gave an extra jump. So then they would end up with an entire sheet of paper that kind of looks like an EKG strip, but wherever there's an extra jump, that's somebody hitting the button. And they would be able to look and figure out where a minute had started, because that would be a blank space. I'm trying to find one. Well, like right here, right here is the beginning of a new minute. There's an empty spot, so here's one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. It wasn't hard to get down to the tenth of a second. They even went down to the hundreds and the thousands of a second by using this ruler. And they were able to figure out the exact moment that a star crossed the meridian according to the clock. And then they would look it up in the Master Naval Observatory ephemeris. And then they would know what time it was supposed to cross. If there was a difference in those two times, it was the clocks that were off because the Earth is never wrong. The stars are never wrong. So it was usually in a fraction of a second. 
They would do a dozen or so stars a night. They would average the clock, clock correction, then end up going downstairs and adjusting the best clocks to get them in sync with the real star time. They did that every day, and then they sent that time signal underground behind tech to the factory so that in the finish room they could listen, look at the clock, test them, and then on the spot, if there was a watch that was not measuring time correctly, they would open it, make their adjustments, close it back up, and stamp it behind by the stars, the Elgin Observatory. I have a watch here that is older because it's from the National Watch Company, so they hadn't changed their name to Elgin National Watch yet. And you can see uh, women wore a smaller version pinned on their dress. Um, this would be a man's pocket watch. You use this to wind it so you didn't have to open the back, but I want to show you the back. This is called the escapement, and that little wheel is run by a spring that makes it go back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And this little tiny lever here can be slid, oh, it's a little stronger, to make it go slightly slower or faster. And they would adjust it, they'd make sure it's in agreement with the master clocks, and then the next day they'd come back, oh, it's a little off, so you've got to make it go a little faster. They would adjust this two or three times, and then they could say, this was timed by the stars. It's exactly correct. If you look closely, you can see some little jewels here. Because when metal pivots against metal, it's friction, and it wears out, and then it won't be accurate. So they use little chips of garnet and an expensive gemstone. And the more jewels you had, that meant the more accuracy of your watch. And you can see it says Elgin. Illinois here yeah. in the uh, escapement and in the front it would look like gotta get my fingernails here this mm -hmm. and you could even open the crown and reset your clock so I've been diddling around with it so much today it's probably not accurate but what does your watch say I hate to say it but my it, phone says yeah. it is 750 Okay, well, I'm close. Um, maybe two minutes fast. But you know what? That or a $10 watch from Kmart is more yeah. accurate today than these things. But this was very important if you were out at sea. You needed to know the time to calculate how far east and west you were. At night, you can see the North Star, Polaris, is so close to the actual pole that uh, the measurement from the horizon up to that star tells you exactly how far north of the equator you are. So that's a very easy thing to do. A, a kid could do that. But to know how far east and west you are takes some complicated math, some spherical trigonometry and charts, and you need to know the time. So you needed a watch that was very accurate. and. Uh, the, British government awarded a prize that today would be like $10 million to a man by the name of Harrison who invented a watch. Well, I saw it two summers ago in London. It doesn't look anything like this. It's like a clock. It's this big. But it compensates for the rolling of a ship so that it's not thrown off. It was very accurate and it could really uh, do much better. You've got to remember 200 years ago, Britain was the leading country in the world with their navy, the, you know, India, many parts of Africa, North America all belong to England, so right. they needed to know the time in different places. And then in the late 1800s, a bunch of rich dudes that owned railroads got together and said, you know, this business, if you got on the railroad here and went to Chicago, you'd have to reset your watch about 11 times, because every community you stopped at had a different local time. And they said, this is nuts. So they came up with this idea of time zones. So time was important if you were out at sea, time was important if you were on land, and people had to know what the time was.
over time, uh, radio kind of took over this room. It was the chronograph room, and then it became known as the radio room. Uh, there were um, transmitters here, all the employees here, the directors and assistants were always FCC certified because they started sending the time signal via um, radio and then radio ended up sending time signals, broadcasting time signals out for the public and they always had a little plug for Elgin National Watch Company in those advertisements and it was terrific for marketing. They sold a lot of watches. They really got a lot of brand recognition out there by sharing the time that they already had calculated here. It was just a matter of transmitting it, transmitting it out. This room was also, after the, after the chronograph room and after it was the radio room, when they weren't measuring time here anymore, um, it was for a while a lab, a semiconductor lab. They did research with um, different chemicals for batteries. There are, I guess, a couple of patents in the U.S. Patent Office out of this building on um, battery chemicals. I don't know the exact details of what kind. I think they were rechargeable batteries. Um, but the research was done out of this room. There was still some ventilating equipment in the windows when I started here six years ago because those chemicals would give off fumes that as they were working became dangerous. So the windows had these like fans kind of rigged up in them uh, so the guys were able to breathe when they were working. This was the bedroom area. It was called the bedroom because they were allowed to um, rest if there was rain or it was between observations. That's the original sink from 1909. They took the bed out within a couple of years and this always was a storage research room um, and it was probably most recently used as the staging area for refurbishing that Collins transmitter and it was also used in the 70s for um, 70s and maybe 80s uh, a radio club excuse me a radio club and they collected all sorts of equipment and played around with it and they took things apart and they made them bigger and better uh, and then tried to improve them and played around to see what they could make and what they could do and experimented with some early um, satellite imagery that they would take and uh, make these um, satellite, the very earliest of the Doppler radar uh, recordings. Um, it's not original to the building, this radio stuff, but it is part of the building's history. So I keep this equipment here. I'm in the process of getting it labeled, marked, so I know what the pieces are, why they ended up here. Some of it's a mystery. Um, flea market type stuff where the club would come in and just start using wires and taking things apart and trying to make something new and cool. In uh, high school we had a amateur radio group, but we were more interested in trying to bounce signals off the moon. Right. And we made uh, antennas that we could guide to track satellites, which was hot stuff back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about transistors, like right. real basic solid state stuff today why it's nothing you know? and you turn on your TV and you see or your computer and you see radar maps instantly right. and, but for us it was a big thing to try and do that and we, we were successful we were able to get some maps off of satellites we track and going over heads mm -hmm. in the basement there was uh, mirror grinding so I built a telescope here, and I built another bigger one in Adler at Chicago. It took me three and a half years to make it, but I finally finished it. So. basement of the observatory planetarium. We have displays set up for when there's public shows. There's also a back room uh, that since about 1963 uh, with uh, Mr. Tuttle and then Mr. Coutina, many students have uh, built their own telescopes and grinding your own lens was is key and there was is some lens grinding equipment still back there. I still have some of the old tools, some of the artifacts from the tool uh, from the lens grinding and building part of the basement work that went on here. There hasn't been a telescope made down here in a long time. We still have a set of telescopes that were made by Mr. Tuttle and used by Mr. Tuttle and Mr. Coutina for years. Um, 
I do have the mirrors. They are, it is, you are able to use them. Uh, they're about four inch or so reflectors. All homemade parts, that's what telescopes always were. You would buy, you would go to the hardware store and buy parts from the hardware store. Uh, you'd have to order a blank, your glass, and um, that was it. You could make your own telescope. Very few people make their own telescopes nowadays. Uh, one of the displays that I think is the most interesting is the original longitude calculations that Mr. Payne, the original director for the observatory, made in coordination with George Comstock from the University of Wisconsin, the Washburn Observatory there. That had been established in the late 1880s, and they had already figured out their exact longitude by coordinating with the U.S. Naval Observatory. Well, since they knew their exact longitude, they knew that if Mr. Payne here and Mr. Comstock there at the exact same, on the exact same night would wait for the exact same start across the meridian, if they could calculate the time difference between their meridian passes, they could calculate how far east or west our telescope was from their telescope. And they did that on three separate nights. And several of these sheets show all their scribblings and, and, and the calculations that they made and the stars that they looked at. And it turns out these two sheets of paper that I found in the building, original, uh, they're actually on linen. Uh, they calculate that we are four minutes, 32.21 seconds east of Madison, Wisconsin, exactly. So now they have their, the exact meridian calculated here so they can look up every star crossing that's in the ephemeris and do all sorts of calculations for time uh, at the telescope here. So uh, there's a whole set of the letters that George Comstock wrote to Professor Payne. I have contacted University of Wisconsin Washburn Observatory and apparently they don't have any record of the letters that Professor Payne wrote and sent to Mr. Comstock. Unfortunately, at least not a few years ago. I hope that somewhere they're hidden and they don't know about them and somebody's going to find them someday. So I'll keep contacting them to see because uh, I would like to see the other half of these letters. Uh, they're kind of like phone calls is what they remind me of because they had to set up the exact dates and both days had to be clear and both guys had to be available. And I know on one of them, I think it was Mr. Comstack, Mr. Comstack replies and um, sort of apologizes for uh, his wife. He had a dinner party. He forgot about something he had to go to and he was in trouble at home, at home and wasn't able to do the observing on the night they were supposed to. Uh, nowadays we do that in a text in a matter of moments and back then it took probably a week or two to get the mail here to there for them to find out that the other guy wasn't able to do the work. Um, some of the other displays then, we have displays from 1909 to 1960 and then I have a couple sections of that separation point 1960 when it became school district property uh, to present day. So newspaper articles, the Stargazer was a newsletter that was produced out of the observatory by students for many years. I have a copy of every single one. I have copies of articles that Mr. Cutina and Mr. Tuttle had, had published in papers. Um, I have some old advertising pieces from the Elgin National Watch Company that connect to the observatory. Elgin always took advantage of the time by the stars in their advertising pieces. and. Um, I like collecting the ones that do show the observatory. So here we are in the clock room. These are the two master clocks. One was used to record star time, so real time, and the other one was used to, uh, was converted, this time was converted to solar mean time, the time that us humans use. Uh, in our central time zone here. So this was the clock that sent a signal straight upstairs that ran the chronograph machine that was also sent out to the factory and to downtown Chicago where the main offices for the Elgin National Watch Company uh, were held. These clocks were both electrically wound. The, the um, wiring is still sitting in the wall and they, the rate of the pendulum so the rate of the clock swinging was determined by the pressure inside of this bell jar. And the pressure in the bell jar is what they had to change if the clock was running too fast or too slow. So if the clock was running too fast, too freely, 
and they needed to slow it down, they would add air into the bell jar to increase the pressure, which would slow down the swing. And the opposite, if the swing was too slow and they needed to speed it up, they would actually release a little bit of air and allow it to swing a little bit faster. You can even see right here, this is the actual bike pump they would use. Of course, the rubber hosing has been replaced, but there's the spigot where it would either be released or air would be pushed in. Inside each clock, you can see there's a barometer and one millimeter of mercury on the barometer was the equivalent to 18 thousandths of a second change in the clocks per hour. So during the day, during the night, they looked at the stars and they measured them. And then during the day, they did math because they had to figure out the clock correction. And when they figured out the clock correction, somebody had to come in here and figure out how much air to release or put in and carefully watch that barometer as they changed uh, the amount of pressure in there. One other interesting piece in here are the light bulbs, which are actually the heat. This room, the whole building was always uh, heated by a boiler with radiators, which are notoriously um, up and down in temperature. And because these pendulums would swing based on the pressure inside these jars, the temperature in this room had to stay very even or else the temperature inside the sealed jar would change and that would change the pressure. So they had to come up with a way to keep this room perfectly temperature even and they did. They kept it at 81 degrees year round. When the temperature dropped below something like 81, a row of lights would turn on to heat the room. They're very warm. You can feel the heat coming just from that row. They're meant to be hot. They are the opposite of today's energy efficient in that they do let off a lot of heat on purpose. They were supposed to let off a lot of heat. When the room went up two tenths of a degree or so, um, a row of lights would turn off. And in doing so, those three circuits kept the room right at 81 degrees all the time. Now, when it got really, really hot in the summer, this is a basement. This is three foot thick masonry. It didn't ever really get above 81 very often, but when it did, we think, nobody knows for sure if this is really true, but it all makes sense. There's a thermometer right here. That's a thermostat. And there's these two doors that are attached to the thermostat with a big old weight. So when the temperature went above 81.1 in the summer, during a hot spell, there was probably ice on the other side of that door. And this would open automatically and draw in the cool air. The hot air would exit up near the ceiling and thereby air conditioning the room with ice from another room. Pretty ingenious, don't you think? I wouldn't mind having that in a room that doesn't have air conditioning. It, it would work. So that is the clock room. This door was always closed because the temperature in that room had to stay exactly 81 degrees. So the operators, the directors could come and they could peek in and make sure that the clocks were running correctly. They could check the temperature because this is a thermometer. Um, another one of Julian uh, Fries's thermometers, original for, from the building. So they could monitor, but nobody was allowed to open the door other than the director once a day, because the moment you open this door, you're going to allow outside air in, which is going to change the temperature, albeit slightly. It'll change the temperature and change the rate of the clocks, and that was a big deal. So they were very into their accuracy, so once a day somebody would actually enter the room to make those adjustments. So, welcome to the planetarium. This is the classroom where students come, and have come for 52 years, for lessons about the night sky. First with Mr. Tuttle from 1960 to 1985, then with Mr. Coutina from 1985 until 2009, and now with me, Mrs. Hernandez, from 2009 until present day. Uh, some of the equipment is original. The star projector is from 1963. It was originally installed with the room. Uh, it became a, a very common kind of the workhorse projector for the Spitz company that installed it. And it is original. There's been some upgrades. It's in really good condition. Uh, we maintain it well, and it makes a beautiful, beautiful star field. It looks just like the nighttime sky. Of course, we've upgraded a little bit as well. In the corner over there, we have a 
newer digital video projector. With that curved mirror, it ends up projecting on the entire dome. Uh, so we also use that to supplement lessons and public shows. And between those two star fields, it's got everything covered. I think I know it's blurry, but that's the moon. If you sit still, can you tell that it's moving? Yeah. All right. This is actually where um, trucks would pull up. Oh, okay. They, they built this. Um, there was always an addition here, and it was built on so that the trucks could back up and actually bring the watches here for about five years in the 1940s. Because people apparently bought the ones that said that they were timed at the observatory. Not just from the time calculated at the observatory, if they were actually timed here. So some watch company employees were here during the day and would actually time the watches and literally bring them back out on the truck and the truck would go back across the street to the factory. It was a marketing you know, thing. It was because people bought those watches. Are the mounts for a platform that was out here for some telescopes that were set up to watch the star Arcturus that during the World's Fair in Chicago 1933 I think the Chicago World's Fair um, they would use a photo cell that had been de developed down at um, U of I and originally was used at U of I the very first night to turn on the lights at the World's Fair uh, and it was so popular with the crowd, the Elgin National Watch Company said they would do it the rest of the show, the rest of the fair. So there was a big rotating platform, a couple of big telescopes on this, and they would use it to gather some light from Arcturus, a star that's 40 light years away, that 40 years prior had been just emitting its light at the Columbian Exposition. So. There was sort of a connection there that 40 years later at the Chicago World's Fair, they were able to gather that light and use it on that photo cell to trigger an electrical impulse to turn on the lights at the fair. So that's what these concrete things are for. The four metal bars sticking up out of the ground over there were the uh, weather station. There was weather measuring equipment put in there by the Weather Bureau at the time down at Springfield, and they put the equipment in. The observatory didn't do any weather forecasting, but the Weather Bureau trusted that since there were scientists working here, that they would accurately measure uh, the recordings. So for through the 1960s, uh, somebody went out every day and recorded the high temperature, the low temperature, everything that was in the equipment box. Um, I don't have any really good pictures of it close up to know exactly what was in there, but I know that it was in that box. and. There was also an uh, anemometer and some measuring equipment up on the roof that every day the astronomers here would go up and record the information from or read it from downstairs and send it off to Springfield for many, many years. So there's actually a weather connection to this building uh, that many people don't know about. It's, if you stand even with it, it is guaranteed that if you took a string and attached it to the middle of the telescope and then kept on going, you would be at the South Pole or if you went this way, you would be at the North Pole. It is oh, wow. absolutely, definitely um, due north and south. It's from the radio equipment. This was the original pole that they had a piece of copper wire strung over to the building when they started doing radio um, broadcasting, transmitting, receiving, whatever they did with the radio here. Um, but we have supported it with the metal mm -hmm. so it doesn't completely go down because it is part of the history of the building. It's Totally protected 1909 woodwork. There's a box of equipment here. I don't know exactly what parts were out here, um, but as you can tell, you could actually climb this. 
measure the wind direction and wind speed. There's a newer piece of equipment up there to measure the wind speed, but the original one is still partially up there. Some of it's fallen down, the wood's rotting. This is uh, Julian Free's equipment, Belfort Observatory, Baltimore, Maryland. Julian and his son Joseph had um, weather measuring equipment uh, manufacturing company in Baltimore and um, Steve Kahn and a group of weather historians from WGN came out a few years ago and uh, they were digging this because it's original it's a really neat piece of history of weather measuring history now this is cooler in the fall and the winter when there's not all the leaves but you've got a view of Elgin here you can see the tower building ah. right across there But that would have been the factory right there, all along there behind those houses. You would have easily been able to see it. And there was even a mansion here. Um, you know, it wasn't Mr. Raymond. It was one of the. It was one of the seven stars. I think that's what they called them. The seven original owners, you know, founders of the Elgin National Watch Company. Um, and he had a nice little mansion here. And then there was the Collingborn Mansion, was right next door to this building. That property backed up to Lincoln School, which is on the other side of the block, that was uh, essentially right down the street from the factory. I don't remember the year it was built. Uh, uh, it was still in operation, I know, in the late 1960s. Uh, that's probably about when Lincoln School closed down. And they say most of the houses in this neighborhood were built by watch company money. Wow. That was their income. That was the economic livelihood of the neighborhood. And this is the dome to the planetarium, correct? Exactly. Right. Exactly. This is attached behind the building. You can't really see it from the street. Right. But it is definitely prominent once you get over here. I mean, it's clearly two stories high. Right. Um, but you just barely see the top of it when you're on the bus. And mm -hmm. so many kids get confused because they're just certain right. that that's the dome that they're sitting under. Mm -hmm. um, standing here and looking, it's tiny. Right. I, I can't even fit 20 people up there at a time, much less a whole class. Right. That's for sure. And I am Peggy Hernandez, the current planetarium teacher here at the Elgin School District U46 Planetarium and Elgin National Watch Company Observatory. send the correct time. From the Elgin Observatory in Elgin, Illinois, we bring you by direct wire correct star time. Correct to the hundredth of a second. Elgin is the only watch company in the world maintaining an observatory, observing, recording, and broadcasting time from the stars. When you hear the final tone beat, it will be exactly 9.16 Central Standard Time. 916 Elgin Observatory Time.